Uh, got any got any fun Valentine's plans for this year? Uh, to watch one of two remakes of classic slasher movies that star uh, actors from the show Supernatural <laughs> that came out in the year two thousand nine. That's that's what I have planned. What about you, Connor? Uh, you know, I didn't have anything before you just said that. I think I might steal that idea. Um, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I got to revisit uh, this movie that we're going to be talking about today for this episode. I um, think I might uh, think I might give the original a watch, maybe. I uh, haven't, haven't revisited that in a while. Um, you know, I think something like that could be fun. Um, the, the possibilities are endless, I suppose, but, uh, I, I guess we should introduce the audience to today's topic. Of course, this is not that bad. We are in season two. We are in the weeds here, having fun covering movies like we always do. Uh, I, of course, am one of your co-hosts. My name is Connor, AKA your slutty Valentine. And I'm joined, of course, by the illustrious, the amazing, the incredible, some would say, Mr. Gabe Tice. Gabe, uh... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who wouldn't say? <laughs> Let's, I need to make an enemies list, apparently. Who wouldn't say that? No. Uh, I'm Tom dip- Green. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, yes, uh, we are, we're, we're talking about this, uh, this, this remake of what many consider nowadays, retroactively uh, at least, to be a classic in the realm of slasher films. Quentin Tarantino's favorite slasher film. Quentin Tarantino's favorite slasher film. We're talking about uh, My Bloody Valentine 3D from 2009 here, um, released uh, back then just uh, before, kind of like an inspiration for, in some ways, the big 3D boom in horror uh, throughout the early 2010s. This came out in 09. Uh, 62% on Rotten Tomatoes, 2.4 out of 5 on Letterboxd. <laughs> Isn't 62 um, on Rotten Tomatoes pretty high? Uh, pretty, for yeah. the like remake of a, of a relatively obscure slasher film? It surprised me. I, I didn't think it was that's that That's well like a high critics. number. Um, which kind of makes you wonder what exactly the expectations or the standards were for for horror remakes by 2009. Obviously, they started off on a pretty strong note with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but then I feel like it, the reputation of the horror remake took a serious beating around 2005 because you had like the Amityville horror remake. Um, I think the, the Fog remake, but then. You know, after that, what you get, you get Rob Zombie's Halloween. We all know how that went. Smashing down with success, fans. truthfully. Um, the, Box the office wise, movie, yeah. but it was this real turning point, I think, in how horror fans were receiving these movies. Like, if you re- remake The Fog, which is, in the grand scheme of things, a B movie in the John Carpenter catalog, but then you have the audacity to remake Halloween. I feel like that's when you really kind of earn the ire of, of horror fans and then obviously right after that friday the 13th then after that it's a nightmare on elm street and for some reason it's that movie that i think kills the trend for good i mean you have some other kind of like soft reboots coming after that like piranha right. 3d another 3d movie but that whole era of the horror remake i think ends with a nightmare on elm street comparing it to this would you say that my bloody valentine 3d uh is a relatively respectful or respectable remake when you look back at this whole period yeah and and, well and it's interesting too because it's a part of that conversation of like for a while i'd say since the 90s right there was kind of this like stop and start method to remaking horror films like you know we got a couple of like remakes of very old horror movies in the 90s uh, and then there was a stop for a couple of years and then Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out. And then, you know, for the next few years, there was, you know, and then 2006 is when like, you know, t- yeah, right. Like you said, 2005, 2006 is kind of like where you saw that quality dip a whole lot. And then like you started seeing more studios could do kind of like original stuff or at least like, you know, ripoffs of original movies, <laughs> you know, like not ripoffs, but, you know, they're capitalizing off of it. You started seeing like movies like Hostel come out, you know, where that was like very much off of the success of Saw and you saw movies like that sort of take the forefront over remakes. And then Rob Zombie's Halloween comes out. uh, And then the next couple of years are again, dominated by the horror remake. And there was this kind of stop and start. Uh, And this movie kind of falls 
in the middle of that period, uh, or I guess tor- kind of towards the tail end, but you can consider towards it the, the tail middle. end. I mean, it comes um, out the year of the Friday the Thirteenth remake yes. or reboot, whatever we shall call it, Friday the Thirteenth, two thousand nine. Yes, which you know people are warming up to that movie gradually, but and it certainly made a lot of money. I mean, most of these movies did make a lot of right. money. Yes, very much. But so. but definitely the fan reaction was pretty hostile, from what I remember, and I think that was the expectation across the board for these new remakes by 2009 was they're going to get a music video director they're going to get a tv actor do a lot of cg blood this is coming out at i feel like the bottom of the barrel period of remakes where they still had a a few of the big titles to go through again the nightmare on elm street is after this but they're remaking what was then a very obscure uh title (laughs) the canon of of 80 slasher films and, you know it, i don't know what the cult following looked like for the original back then obviously now people like me adore that movie it's one of my favorites and again you know it has the support of quentin tarantino but i mean i don't think most people going to see this movie knew it was even a remake i so i can vividly remember the marketing campaign for this movie to seeing trailers on television back in 2009 maybe 2008 uh, i don't remember when they first started kind of propping up but um uh, i would talk to people about the trailer for this and being like oh man i really want to go see that but you know my parents will let me watch horror movies you know this <laughs> kind of kid i wasn't and uh and but um nobody knew anything about the original movie then uh and even i, th- I think that's something that is somewhat of an advantage for this movie is that um, at the time it felt like the audience or the general public as a whole really didn't have knowledge of, or maybe very loosely had knowledge that it might exist. Um, And, uh, and so when it came out, you know, you had those horror fans that were kind of those diehards that were going to go see it because it's a remake of a classic that they love. Um, But uh, the audience as a whole kind of at large was just going to see this 3d horror movie that they've been seeing trailers for every single time their favorite show goes to commercial um, uh, especially when one of those shows with this when one of those shows is supernatural uh yes. which uh has the star of this movie yes it does just like the friday the 13th uh remake had uh the other star jared padalaki in its yep. in its cast uh just a we- i don't know if their agents like sign an oath with each other (laughs) uh, or how that went down. It's just one of those really bizarre things to me. And it really makes it hard to not somehow see both of those remakes as somehow possibly being canon in the world of Supernatural. I do not watch that show. So I can't, I can't explain that rationally, but I, you know, some part of me would definitely like to think so. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've never seen the show. Uh, I've seen like, you know, the bloopers that float around on the internet every once in a while, uh, or, you know, clips that are used in memes and such. But, uh, based on what I've heard about the show, you know, the, the this being in the realm of possibility is not something that's, <laughs> that's too outlandish in the supernatural universe. Uh, some, I, I suppose crazier things have happened. Um, Jensen Ackles actually, uh, who's in this movie, I learned, um, just recently that, the, that he actually helped, uh, direct a couple of scenes in this film as he had directed some episodes of the television series he was on of Supernatural. Um, and, uh, they got him for this movie and obviously hot ticket star, you know, CW people can clown on the CW all they want. You know, I'm one of those people who will t- partake in the, in the, the nobody clowns on shows nobody clowns on jensen ackles or no or supernatural is generally a very beloved program you can see it's an enterprise and, yeah yes it's it's huge um and, and jensen and ackles you know huge. he he had a huge guest spot on the boys recently he did yes so his uh his, his career is being kept alive and well by by his fans and by by audiences clearly this is a guy that people uh really like and yeah. i think he's, he's actually super... in the calling for dc people they want him to be batman and brave and bold coming up, i i've so. heard that and he yeah. he it makes sense he did voice work he did uh, yes, the he voice did. of uh, i think jason todd in uh, under the red hood which a I lot of people so. consider yeah. one of the one of the better dc animated films so he's a guy i like a lot i think he's super charismatic and you know he 
if we lived in a world where movie stars still existed, I think he would be in line to, you know, to be one of those names, right? He's a great candidate for that. Um, but the thing about this is, and the, and the reason why it was such a weird get, like let's get Jensen Ackles for this role. This, this does not play into his strengths at all. Like if we start talking no. about the movie here, I think nothing about what, what endears Jensen Ackles to people is really in this character, which I think was probably interesting for him. He got to challenge himself, but I can imagine that, especially if you're a supernatural fan going to see Jensen Ackles starring in a movie, you know, this guy, he's, he's twitchy, he's sketchy, he's kind of a bum and not one with a heart of gold. And then, you know, we can get into the ending later, but that's sort of a, I think that might <laughs> sink it, sink its rewatchability for those, right. uh, supernatural fans yeah i i think you know we talk about comparing these remakes of the time i, I would argue that friday the 13th uh even though it, i don't think it used uh jared padalecki to its to his full potential and, and to what he would see you know what you would see on a show like supernatural i think it was much closer to what fans would be expecting when he goes to the big screen, then Jensen Ackles was in this. And that definitely felt like a better vehicle. If you just yeah. look at these as vehicles, which is, I mean, what they are, I think, I mean, I remember leaving uh, Friday the 13th with a really good impression of Jared Padalecki. Me too. Yep. Yeah. And I, I, not... I, I felt very indifferent, even still. And I, I'm going to reveal something about this movie as we go. Uh, mm -hmm. But I I do, even still, after this recent rewatch, I, I kind of look at Jensen Ackles after this as sort of indifferent. I don't see it as like a shining performance for him. I don't see it as uh, a terrible one either. It's not a bad impression or a great one. It's just No, because he's a impression. good actor. He's a good right. actor. Exactly. Not really being used to his full potential right. or his full capabilities. Whereas... I think they worked Jared Padalecki's charm, his strengths as an actor, really well into that Friday the 13th remake. I mean, honestly, he's one of my favorite parts about that movie. He was always one of uh, the things I, I was inclined to defend the movie for, you know, especially back in the day when people were just shitting on it. And I and people people have always said that movie has no likable characters when Jared Padalecki is right there <laughs> being the hero of the movie. So I, I never understood that critique. But Ironically, that's definitely something you could say about this movie. I mean, uh, I guess we can start there, right? I mean, we have, and this is interesting about this movie that it is actually a remake. It's not like the Friday the 13th situation where it's clearly a soft reboot. Like this is right. a remake with the same characters and the same character dynamics from the original, um, which is kind of off-putting when you get later into the movie and you see what they decide to change. But Starting out on, the, on that premise, we have a love triangle. Let's compare it briefly to the love triangle in the original, which I thought was super endearing. I thought that that whole thing, uh, it was cheesy, but it gave that movie heart. Um, what do you think about the love triangle in this version? Um, I think it plays, it plays to some of the negatives that I do have about this movie. Um, I, I do, you know, I'm, I'm going to spoil a little bit of how I feel about this. I was actually really surprised when I rewatched this because I, I it was one of the first few movies I actually had in my collection when I started collecting films. This was just like a very cheap buy. Uh, and um, it actually came with the 3D glasses uh, when I bought it, which was super cool. I still have them somewhere. Um, I'm glad and... you have fond memories of the 3D. Of well, see, movie. no. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't really watch 3D. 3D kind of makes me sick. Uh, like not in a, like physically, it makes me right. ill. Uh, it's nauseating. Yes, it's nauseating. Uh, I, I like the premise of it. And truthfully, I'm actually more of a fan of being on the other side of a 3D movie where I'm not watching it in 3D. Just that I'm, I'm sort of marveled by the thought process of the whole thing, you know, where it's like, Let's make a movie garnered around shooting things in an audience's face is is a very interesting thought process to me. And uh, I like to watch a movie not in 3D that's intended to be in 3D. Um, I don't know what it is. I've always been that way. Uh, but even with this film, um, you know, it was an early buy for me, but I was really surprised this time around about how much I actually really enjoyed it. Um, that said, there are problems with this movie. Uh, awkward dialogue, certainly a problem in this movie, specifically with this triangle we have. 
Um, uh, lack of charisma is definitely there. But it's not just a um, lack of charisma, and I because that's a super. That's not a. Uh, that's not really a fair critique, right? Because charisma. How do you measure charisma? And what does that really matter? I guess that's in, fair. In a, in a story like this, I think my problem is you're not even given the chance to like these people. You're not given a chance <laughs> to root for them. I mean, I, I, and and there's something interesting that they do, right? So so Jensen Ackles' ca- character, um, is partly to blame for uh, all of the terrible things that happen, right? Yeah. Because he's the person who accidentally gets Harry Warden locked um, in the shaft with everybody, and then Harry Ward breaks out and kills a lot of people in a rage. Um, of course, in this version, he uh, is not a cannibal. He just killed his fellow um, hit miners uh, for the oxygen, which, you know, it's interesting that even in a movie that was trying to flex how um, how bloody, how gratuitous it was going to be with its violence uh they they still have to make changes like that so just shows you how the landscape uh has still clearly shifted but oh yeah jensen ackles is introduced as as being like this ne'er-do-well kind of like pitifully stupid kid uh (laughs) and there's something very phony about the whole thing because it's jensen ackles we know it's jensen ackles he he still has an inherently kind of like anti this energy you know what i mean it's like it would be like casting timothy chalamet to play one of the trump kids like (laughs) he he could look the part he could dress the part but i don't really buy that timothy chalamet uh is the son of donald trump it's just uh it's a hard sell and that's probably the real genesis of my grievance with the characters here even when i understand people's motivations it's not clicking with the performances and it's not clicking with the casting this isn't going to be the right term it's just the term i use in my own head but this this movie very much felt like casting for like the film's vanity you know like the movie will do better because we have these names attached to it uh and and horror has never been one to get like a lot of people for that obviously you know they threw a bone to horror fans with a guy like tom atkins in the movie which i know that the director and writer were a big fan of um so it made sense that he was there um but um jensen ackles definitely felt like that some of these other actors and actresses i guess were pretty up and coming at the time as far as like you know being kind of mainstream uh i know jamie king had been in um uh white chicks popular movie a few years before this came out Uh, a couple of other things i don't want to undersell her career or anything but uh yeah it felt very much uh, this this is where i can kind of compare this a little bit more with nightmare the nightmare remake reboot you know whatever you want to say uh I, i felt like this is sort of similar in a way where it felt like a lot of the casting decisions didn't really work for the movie um, they didn't always work against the movie. There are parts that I do think uh, that Jensen Ackles does very well. Again, he's a very good actor. Um, some of the other actors as well. Um, of course, Tom Atkins chimes in everything. Dude's a, a gem. Um, but uh, yeah, there was something, there was just, there were a lot of scenes where I felt that something was missing. And it, I, I didn't, I don't subscribe to the same thing that I saw in a lot of reviews where people said that the acting itself isn't very good. Um, I don't agree with that, but I do think there is an element of um, something being missing from a lot of scenes in this movie. And for me, it created sort of an awkwardness when I was watching it. Um, Well, it just creates this sense of like art artifice, right? There's something, Yeah. there's, I mean, compared to the original where, you know, no green screen, no 3D production, they, actors were really in those minds being chased by, by a guy who looked like Harry Warden. And, you know, that's that's the nature of low-budget production. They can't afford to be fake. They have to do it for real. This production, I mean, obviously, I'm sure the actors were paid much better. I'm oh, sure yeah. the conditions on set were much better. And I don't think that we have to return to, like, grungy, um, underground 80s kind of slasher production standards. But there should be a way to still submerge 
the audience in this atmosphere, right? There should still be a manner of creating a threatening aura to the movie. And for some reason, I think it's probably because of the 3D. I think all of these um, aughts 3D movies had this problem. Uh, Saw 3D might be the most egregious. There's just something about the way it filters uh, the the visuals. It's something about the, it's like this ugly smear on the camera for me. And it's a huge, it, it's a really shallow complaint. And I'm mad at myself that I can't get over it more. But at the same time, I mean, it's my eyes can never fall under the illusion that I'm watching something that's really happening. So you're absolutely right. But I, I want to kind of explain why that works for me. Uh, because we've discussed this in the past. We talked about this when we talked about Godzilla 98, when we talked about uh, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, uh, which returns to theaters this May. Very excited yeah. about that. Um, but, I am uh, too, somehow. I, I, maybe yeah. you converted me uh, more than I realized after That's our it. episode. Um, but uh, love to revisit that one someday. But um, here, here's, here's the thing about me i have this weird fascination with these movies that just that just whore themselves out you know like (laughs) i don't know what it is and i don't always like them uh sometimes i'm just fascinated by them but when a movie is everywhere you look and for a horror film this really was like you had my bloody valentine collector's cups and special edition glasses that you could get in the i do remember the marketing being popcorn boxes ever present it was everywhere it was yeah. everywhere and it was it was uh you know uh, movies like that fascinate me but what the, what also fascinates me about movies that do that is that maybe 60 to 80 percent of them you know the entire time that you're watching a movie and i know some people are like oh what do you mean but like that sounds stupid but the whole point of watching a film and, and a film that you enjoy is this suspension of disbelief yeah you may mm-hmm. know that this is you know scout taylor compton being chased by former professional wrestler tyler main but the movie makes you think that laurie strode is going to get killed by michael myers that's what you believe when you're watching the movie uh and when you're watching this i don't feel that at any point in this movie i see tom atkins i see jensen ackles i see jamie king i see all these people in the movie that i know and i see very pretty people by the way yes yes and and but there's something about those movies that feel fake that that still entertain me. If if the movie can still entertain me, then it adds to this charm that a movie can have of like this does feel overly huh. fake and overly and and I don't know what it is about me because I'm is not it, a super commercial person, but like is it with the movies, ex- hmm. I don't know. Is it the extended sequence of the of full frontal nudity? Could that could that be? <laughs> Well, no, honestly, um, honestly, that was that was one of the sequences that actually took me out more than anything that I was just kind of like, all right, like, come on. (laughs) Well, it is distracting, to say the least. I mean, I actually think the movie uh, and the thing is that actress, she's the one who came up with the idea. She is be yes, fully naked the whole to time. give the filmmakers credit. And I'd like to get into them in a moment, too. But yes, continue. Sure. But. The reason I point that out is, you know, you watch that scene and you think, okay, they are going for that old school slasher or maybe even a parody uh, or a send up a riff on, on yeah. slasher cliches. And that's not the case. It was like a, a technical matter. It just, the actress didn't want to have to run around with, with a blanket or a robe or, or something to right. that effect. And that was kind of like this, this disconnect for me because it's the most memorable scene of the movie. It's something that everybody was talking about. But that represented a disconnect for me because there it revealed to me that there wasn't there wasn't really a, a, a vision of of personality i think to this movie like i it, it was not intended to be uh you know stylistically an homage to those classic slasher flicks i i think it wanted to blend in with the newer crop of of, of horror like saw or or hostile maybe there's certainly enough dismemberment and and uh, gratuitous gore right as as fake as it looks and as unpleasant and an ice where as it looks t- to my eyes but i for me to really endear myself to a movie it has to have a clear personality and there was 
And that's the one moment where I thought they were going for, for something that resembled like, you know, a sense of humor. Uh, but it turned out to not be so. This movie does not have re- a real <laughs> personality. This Are you going to say something nice eventually? Because you said yeah. you did enjoy this movie. No, but, but like everything I'm saying so far, like I know it sounds like a negative, but it's a positive for me. Like uh-huh. I, I kind of like that this movie is just a hollow, <laughs> like just flashy remake. I, I, I love it. I, I, It feels like a very specific era of movie not that this this type of movie doesn't exist now but it exists in a different way you know it's like maybe these marvel movies that are coming out are soulless and just you know cash grabs and all that but like the horror movies that we get a lot of times now and and i by the way i very much enjoy this because a lot of them are very 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 good movies um but there's so much like heart behind them and there's so much passion behind them and like look at the movies that are doing the best right now man like x pearl we got maxine coming out later this year uh anything by ari Esther is doing very well and um you know there's like not really i mean bo's afraid was kind of a big flop well i mean people tend to really like these movies okay they don't do terribly commercially i mean bo's afraid might be an exception to that i think that movie was a little too they let they gave him a little too much freedom (laughs) i didn't i mean i'm not it's not a dig at anybody they they made a flop and they knew it. They knew they made something right. that was not going to sell to audiences and they didn't care. That's just how much cachet Ari Oster has. And, you know, right. you got to respect that. But I can appreciate this era of movie that just feels overproduced. That feels like it was doing everything to just capture as many people to get to the theater as possible. It's like your Walmart of horror movies. And, you know, I don't like going to Walmart all the time. But sometimes I really like, sometimes I go in there and I'm like, man, I should come here more. And then, you know, I'd go there again and I'm reminded why I don't go there. And that's a movie like, you know, okay. I'm not going to say anything bad about that's any movies right now. But crazy because you're speaking to the exact things that people don't like about this movie. I know. Alienate people like me. And what is it? I mean, how much is this nostalgia? Um, A pretty big portion but there's there's also that weird fascination again i don't know where that comes from i don't know if it comes with nostalgia i mean you know obviously when we were kids like you know that was kind of before there were (laughs) at least before they were really regulating marketing to children i mean we got everything marketed to us um like crazy you know everything was a happy meal toy everything was a not obviously horror movies but you know what i mean every movie that came out was this huge marketing piece it was like they spent more on marketing the movie than they spent making it and this is a movie that kind of feels like it fits that um and there is a look and a feel to this movie that just i don't know man i'm like i'm i the second it starts i'm captured and and i don't want to make it sound like this movie is completely without a soul like this movie is completely terrible um it's not i think this is a good example of a movie that still has some of that there um although i do think that the personality it's 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 lacking um but i can see why people wouldn't want to watch a movie okay. like this but i do i i have watched this any day of the week like I, I had a great time it's almost like you're describing the benefits of having a rich friend like rich people are famously not very animated or color colorful personalities usually very business oriented it's obviously <laughs> nice to be in their good graces makes you feel uh, more more well off by being in their presence. Um, I mean, I, I see obviously your points and I'm just coming at it from the opposite end. I mean, I think people- And I get it. Yeah, and the weird thing is I think this is a pretty direct precedence to the, uh, this is the reason why we needed A24 horror. Like this is the reason why we needed elevated horror. I want to make something clear about my position on that is that I don't want every movie to be that, you know, if mm-hmm. every movie were no. that, then I would hate it. I, and, and I completely agree. I do think that it was completely necessary to go the route we did. And the movies that I tend to be that I, I tend to actually fall in love with movies that actually make my favorite horror movies lists, movies that do all of that. They're nothing like what I'm describing and why I'm describing that I like this movie, but 
it's sort of like, you know, if somebody's constantly on a great diet and they have a cheat meal, this is like my cheat meal, man. And 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 it's this is not this the is most it? egregious. This is your cheat. This is not the most egregious example, and I don't like want to make Friday it sound the Thirteenth, like which came out this year. That's my idea of a cheat meal. This is uh, this is like okay, um. And I didn't mean, I'm not trying to be hostile to the movie. I really don't have any, any strong feelings about it other than I hope that it drew attention to the original movie, which, you know, if, if it did, then this was certainly worth making. Yes, I hope so too. But like, okay, I'm in California and I love In-N-Out. In-N-Out <laughs> is a total cheat. I just had In-N-Out. I just had it before we started recording and I went early to in and out to get it because that's how much i like in and out and Hell sorry yeah. to the wife who might be listening uh because she's <laughs> <laughs> trying to correct my my eating habits but in and out that's a cheat but you know what i would never do i would i would never go to burger king why would i go to burger king when i could go to in and out but if the line is too long at in and out which it often is seriously people we we need to do something with with our time other than wait in line at, <laughs> at in and out but if the line's too long and i'm just feeling too lazy and too shitty <laughs> to put real effort <laughs> into my into my lifestyle then maybe i'll go to burger king but i won't feel happy about it and yeah i think if i've if i've burned through the actual guilty pleasures that i love i think i could i could use my bloody valentine 3d but i wouldn't be happy about it so here's the thing, man. I don't really elevate myself past that. You know what I mean? Like I think so. So so I think Friday the Thirteenth. It's not. It's not even on that level for me, man. Like like you know. Whereas you could see that. Yeah, you know, some people would see that as like a guilty pleasure movie, or as like a movie that they would kind of, you know, that's their cheat day meal of equivalent of movies. I love the Friday the Thirteenth movie for two thousand nine. It's one of my favorites in the franchise. And I it's think not ironic it, either. Yeah, half of it is unironically great like it's a extremely well-made movie um basically any uh anytime jason's on screen or anytime he's really lurking about but uh so yeah some of those some of those characters bring it down and dumb it down for sure so it's a very it's an uneven movie there and i call it a guilty pleasure affectionately you know and i think no i get that yeah people who made it wanted to make a guilty pleasure uh uh, what do you think the aspirations were, though, for the people who made My Bloody Valentine 3D? Let's discuss those people real quick, because um, I, I think they're an interesting... I think I want to specifically discuss the writer-director duo. Sure. Uh, uh, Todd Farmer and Patrick Lucier, uh, because they're an interesting duo, I think. Uh, I think I think there's a, there's a conversation there. Because they were almost, they almost played a much bigger role than we kind of think about in this whole kind of 3D horror remake era, like from 2007 to 2000 and maybe 11, maybe early 2012. Um, so they, so they, they made this movie, uh, very popular, came out uh, the same year as Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Uh, incredible movie, by the way. Uh, I, in I case have you guys haven't heard. Sure, <laughs> yeah, in case you haven't heard from us before. Um, and, uh, they would go on to move on to their next project, which was drive angry starring Nicolas Cage did not, uh, that movie didn't, didn't really do him any favors. I don't think, um, but, uh, they were almost responsible for a third movie in Rob Zombie's Halloween verse called Halloween 3d. Um, and uh, they have involvement in horror throughout their timeline. I mean, uh, I believe Todd Farmer wrote Jason X. Uh, Patrick Lucier wrote and directed Dracula 2000. Um, he directed The Prophecy 3 starring Christopher Walken. Uh, so, you know, they have this sort of lineage in horror, but it's not one that, like, people don't know their names the same way they know even, like, a Lee Wan L. You know, Lee Wan L is a good example of a guy who was sort of in the background for a while as far as like the mainstream was concerned. But people started to know his name once he started making awesome movies. <laughs> uh, and these guys really had never broke out of that. But I want to ask you, I, I want to sort of turn it back to you here, because I think their intentions with making this movie was to make a very fun, over the top, commercially successful horror movie. 
I want to say they succeeded in that. And I'm curious if you think the same or if you think maybe there were just some different motives on their side for that. No, I don't think there were any bad motives. I oh, think they were trying to capture, and by that, I mean, I don't think there were cynical motives. I, I mean, from that track record, you know, I, I, their passion for the genre is apparent and, and their, I believe they probably loved the original movie. And I think they wanted to, to capture the magic of that original movie and bring it to um, a new audience, right? And, you know, hopefully divert attention back to that original um, because uh, it adheres so closely to the original um, that it's it's clearly respectful. Yeah. Right? So I think they had the intention of, I mean, I, I don't think it was one of those kind of like Quentin Tarantino nostalgic fest. Like, I want audiences to know what it was like to sit, to, to, to walk into a theater and, and, and sit through My Bloody Valentine or, or Rob Zombie. Right you know, doing that for, for horror movies with House of a Thousand Corpses. It was modern. It's a modern production. There was no intention to make it retro. I mean, that wasn't in vogue yet. Not really. I think if if they waited a few years later, they could have gone out with like a period piece, like a practical effects galore type of remake. But that's not where the culture was. So they had good intentions. Uh, they're they're skilled writers you know you can't have a career in, in this business for that long without some serious like measurable skills some serious merit Absolutely. to your work and you know it's a competent screenplay i really don't i don't really i mean people can joke about the dialogue right uh, but you know there is some there, there's definitely an attempt to play with the structure play with the formula um, which, you know, I don't know if we want to get into the ending yet, but I can, I can at least say without any spoilers that, you know, it, it takes a major left turn to the original movie's right turn. Yeah, this is one of those movies that's the rare example of like a movie that's a remake or, or you know, is doing something with an original source material that still kind of somewhat remains, I don't want to say unpredictable, but you're sort of it, it's less predictable if you've seen the original movie you know <laughs> which usually isn't the case usually if you've seen the original you know what's going to happen in the remake and unless they completely reboot it um which i'm glad by the way that they did with friday the 13th i don't know that that story would have lent itself as kindly to uh the time period especially oh, you didn't want to see the return of, of <laughs> no. pamela Voorhees? no um no absolutely not never uh i don't care what anybody says absolutely not never <laughs> in a million years um so um but they, they, you know, in that movie, they were still respectful of that that was what the original movie was. They still kind of threw those fans a bone and kind of put her in there very briefly. And uh, this movie, I think, it was a little bit easier for them to stay pretty faithful. Um, you know, honestly, I'll be honest, like, I had a pretty unfavorable opinion about Todd Farmer and Patrick Lucier for a little while because... Um, because of their involvement such, with Halloween? Well, just as, as such a big fan, when I read that script, I remember just being so disappointed um you know as as uh, i didn't understand the intention i didn't understand anything but hearing them talk about it and especially after re-watching this movie i can't really believe that i'm gonna say this and i would never treat it as a true third entry but i'd be really interested to see what their take on halloween would look like they, i mean they they've said it before that they wanted to be a little bit more faithful to they, basically they wanted to take the beast that rob zombie created with michael myers and kind of blended a little closer to what John Carpenter's version was, I would have really liked to have seen what they could have done with that. And I think the story and the things that they were going to do was, was a little out there. And again, not a true third entry to me who, who thinks the, the se you know, ending of the second movie is perfect for me. Um, that said, uh, you know, these are guys that I, I, I kind of miss filmmakers like this, you know, who just, they like horror and they really are into it and they're not really the most, you know, artistic guys, you know, they're not like going out there and making movies like Ty West is, you know, where Ty West is clearly a fan of the horror genre. He, he also has some unique thoughts and he also does things a little differently. No, look, um, if we're, like we're going to stick like to this. the foods metaphor, which sure, why not? Look, Ty West, with all his respectability, with all his panache, you know, he's like a, he's, he, he's, he's the vegan dish that I should get, <laughs> that I know I should get. Got a lot um, of those in LA, right? Too many. It's yeah. like 
get that out of my face. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they want... set those places on fire here in Georgia. So <laughs> yeah, I don't want vegan barbecue out. I don't even know what that is. Uh, that, that sounds horrific. Uh, yeah, but uh, as a, uh, yeah. Ty, Ty West, you know, he he demands patience from his audience, especially with yes. his yes. With, with his to me still his finest movie. Um, uh, why is the name escaping me? Oh my god, The House of the Devil. House of the Devil is very very good. Yes, it's taut. It's it's thrilling and it rewards that patience. But you don't have to, you don't have to be patient with with these guys. I mean, they they no. are you know there there's a showmanship. There's a there's like an it's like a an audience first approach. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking because it's not this like we've we've talked about something on the show before where where filmmakers sort of feel like they know better than an audience or at least they feel like they know better than the source material if it's like a remake or they feel like they're above it and these guys are just like no like the audience wants to see (laughs) tits gore and and 3d and that's what we're gonna give them and we're gonna do it the best way that we know how and and i don't think it's fair to reduce the movie to just that because i don't think it is just that i do think there are some interesting things going on in the story i do psychologically there's there's something very interesting going on absolutely that's an ackles character absolutely um and and i think that even though i did you know we did discuss the relationships between some of these characters being a little odd or or things not clicking exactly that's not the case with every scene in this movie it's not the case with with every interaction that these characters have together um there are just moments where it lacks behind and i I think it's it's a testament to movie to to filmmakers like this who accomplish what they set out to do you know Uh, yeah i think they should be commended for that all the tension is believable yeah i do agree with that where it's lacking is the it's the valentine part of the equation they got the they got the bloody but the actual valentine Ah. you know the there this movie which sounds really silly for me to say about a slasher but i i I, especially comparing it to the original i think it's it's a justifiable critique it really lacks a sense of romance to me it lacks just even the kind of air or atmosphere of valentine's day i completely agree i i think first of all i think changing the setting was a mistake personally um you know the first movie was what was it called like valentine falls uh i can't remember the name of the town it was shot um in canada in a well, yes, real it was mining a Canadian town movie um, yeah. real mining town yeah uh and um they you know they're infamously and, and one of my favorite visuals from the original is the the sign welcoming them to the town with the, you know the big hearts and stuff right. on it and it's really cool um i think i mean you the know, production design was like out of this world in the oh original. my god and and you know and it's it makes the movie very charming to watch you know it makes it makes me feel like uh, i'm watching a movie that was uh, inspired uh, by black christmas a movie yeah. that i absolutely love and it even goes, love even more after this it goes season. back to that whole thing about personality you know yep and that movie it seemed to wear its heart on its sleeve pun intended um and i think all of those things play really well together like i think yes. the sincerity in which you approach all of your themes and all of your characters and every tone you want to hit i mean that really matters like if you treat actually some someone a writer who i saw at a convention once said something really great which is he said that horror movies need to have as much life as they have death right you need that contrast yes that's a great quote yeah it's and i've been thinking about that quote ever since and this movie uh has way more death than life the death to life ratio is kind of (laughs) off the charts um and i you know i'm tempted to place the the blame at the feet of of james wan and lee winnell for saw and eli roth who you know he he was at least tongue-in-cheek in in his approach usually but i think uh they they placed much more of an outsized weight on on death I completely agree. Um, you know, it's it's one of the things that I I, I kind of want to go back to that conversation where it's like, I do believe this movie had a heart behind it, like people making it. I do believe that it had interesting, a lot of interesting things in the story. But I, I think it does go back to this personality where it's like, it plays to the advantage of your movie to have this juxtaposing of like this cutesy, you know, bright pink and red uh, Valentine's Day aesthetic with this like, 
grungy miner going around yes. uh, ripping hearts out of it's, people it's great it's a great juxtaposition and it's one that i think would have and it really kind of boggles my mind when i watch this movie back because i'm like okay uh i do still enjoy this movie quite a bit I, and i've already talked about that but it's like this era especially i feel like they really would have played off this like massive commercial holiday <laughs> by doing more valentine stuff in the movie i, I thought they would have mm. i thought they would just double down on it and and i thought it would be egregious when i first watched this i was i was like oh what are they gonna do you know how much valentine's day is gonna be in this and there's like i don't i can't remember a specific instance where it's really mentioned too much or to they where even like... like they changed something very very integral to the storyline of the original so they changed the fact that originally harry warden was abandoned in that chat because people went to a valentine's day party hence right. he hates valentine's day right no such explanation is given i don't no. think we even know when i mean maybe it happened on valentine's day but if it is it's it certainly doesn't seem to register with anybody purely, co purely coincidental <laughs> yeah purely coincidental so and tiny changes like that because really like what's the big difference if people go to a valentine's day party versus a cake party but tiny differences like that are where are they're going to decide the course of your movie right like right. it's a tiny angular shift but it sets you off on a very different trajectory and I love having a horror movie to watch on Valentine's Day, even though my wife hates horror movies. I still love that <laughs> oh, we have no. such a movie as My Bloody Valentine. And there's some others that we can name drop, but for me, that's that's easily the primo de facto Valentine's Day horror movie. And for some reason, which I think we've gone over the reasons, the remake does not capture that spirit I mean, you know, I think back to this great scene from Black Christmas, the original Black Christmas movie, where, uh, you know, there's this where, you know, she's standing in the doorway and there's these carolers outside and they're singing and it's so cheerful and everybody's smiling. And on the other side of the house, somebody's being brutally murdered. Um, and it's, you know, it's so eerie. It it's, is it, so it's creepy, very eerie and creepy. And, and it, you know, Black Christmas is a movie. I'm not going to share my controversial opinions about Black Christmas uh, here. I don't think that's the place. But um, I do think that when you watch that movie and, and you can watch a movie from the 70s that you can honestly say holds up in its creep factor and its scare factor. And Christmas is a holiday that I know people are much more passionate about. So it's a little bit easier to kind of juxtapose that with something gruesome. But like the <laughs> the blueprints are there for this movie uh -huh. to do that because the original my bloody valentine did that and it feels strange that they would take something a movie that's that's kind of paying so much tribute to its source material and completely sort of neglecting the fact and and, and that's something that these audience first movies often do yeah. is they they miss those little things that well, just kind of need to be there i think we need we need to also establish that this is really more at the uh at the hands of of the production like not the screenwriters right but production yes. team the set designers right, exactly. yes. the cinematographer this movie i normally love <laughs> I, I love these pennsylvania dreary <laughs> right. um bleak movies i mean this movie you know it, it's set on valentine's day but it looks like the deer hunter like that's how yeah. uh yeah. oblique and and miserable everything looks which i usually like that in my horror movies and if that was if i felt like that was more of a conscious choice like okay this is a mining town we're making a movie about people in this miserable community who have one of their own turn on them because of a an accident and it's harry warden is going to be like the punisher of this miserable and forgotten town you know i mean people still talk about how we're losing mining jobs and everything you could even do social commentary if you want to go nuts with it yeah. but but i think honestly it's just more because you know this was the uh this was the style of, of what these glammy horror they, like these glammed up marketable horror movies that's what they looked like it's what they looked like it's what they felt like um you know i understand that perspective and again 
some of it does work for me in this movie, but I really do think this would have benefited from a lot more of an infusion of those little things that made the original so fun. Even though there's a lot of gruesomeness to the original movie, you know, it's like a pretty, it's a pretty gory movie. Um, it's an exceptionally its gory movie. I mean, yeah, at the uh, same time, you have this, this, you know, this love triangle, these really cute characters, really charming mm -hmm. characters. I mean, and aesthetic. The whole the whole lore of that movie is that a miners were trapped in a in a shaft <laughs> and had to turn to cannibalism yep. to survive. Like that's what's at the heart of the original. So it's not a case of like, oh, you know, this movie it's too mean spirited, it's ugly, it's it's gross. Not like that at all. I want those things to be contrasted with something that is going to actually endear me to the movie, right? And you know, that, that's just something that I think the whole scene of horror was lacking. Cool. Um, that said, I do want to bring up a character that I do think works, uh, that I do think is done well. And uh, I'm not even going to say the character's name. I'm just going to give you the name Tom Atkins. And I just want to see what you think of him in this movie, because he was a part that I was really excited upon this rewatch to just kind of see how much he would capture me now that I'm a really big Tom Atkins fan. Um, and uh, I, I thought it, I thought everything with him, I, I just lit up when the guy was on the screen. I'm curious if you felt the same. I lit up the first time he was on screen. Oh no. <laughs> I, well, oh, I guess that sounds a little more destitute than I intended. Uh. <laughs> Look, what I'm trying to say is that who doesn't love Tom Atkins? If you don't, right. if you yeah. don't have a serious affection for Tom Atkins, I really don't trust you. <laughs> that being said, it's great stunt casting, but I, I can't say that. I mean, you didn't even name the character. Like you did that for a reason because it's <laughs> it, it, it's it's stunt casting. It's Tom Atkins, a face we all love in a in a crowded cast of people who I do not recognize. Like I, I only know the names of two actors in this movie, which I mean, whatever. That was basically the case for the Friday remake. And I, I still, you know, could, could invest myself in those characters no tom atkins he was a brilliant piece of stunt casting he his casting gives the filmmakers a lot of credibility but it's not like a quentin tarantino thing where like tom atkins comes in and he is given the role of a lifetime he's oh no given something uh, that that's that's going over the top it, right. it this, was this... just cool casting to me it feels kind of like um and it's obviously very different and it's handled very differently but like this is sort of more like how rob will use some people you know he'll bring in some older actors to do like big things in some especially his original movies but like this kind of feels kind of like um you know i know it's a little bit different but sort of like how he used ken furry in the first halloween movie you know where it's just like a nod to horror fans like hey here's here's your guy but here's you can quote guys. you can quote him in that scene i'm joe grizzly bitch you don't quote I, tom Atkins. okay i can't quote Valentine. tom atkins but only reason i didn't name him is because i figured nobody else would name him it's not because i can't i know his name in the movie what's his name burke his name is burke okay okay um and cool and i think it's not bad you know it's, it's cool like tom atkins he's a cool cat you know it's a cool name um you know I, this I makes did, me I, think of uh paul reiser from from aliens <laughs> burke god burke. damn you but uh no i mean you know i, I um i enjoyed seeing him in this i i like when a f when you know filmmakers and and by the way they were going to include tom atkins in Halloween 3D uh, when they were going to be making that movie. And Tom Atkins was apparently really excited about that. Um, so, yeah, I, I like that he's in this. I like that it's not just a tribute to the genre as far as like, oh, here's this movie. We're going to try to modernize it and make it, you know, fun and profitable and all that. Um, you know, they, they did bring in a legend to, to just kind of get some goodwill from the fans. And I do believe that the filmmakers did appreciate Tom and, and, and wanted him there not just because horror fans would like it, but because right. they would like it. Well, it's just they're horror fans. I have to, my, my enthusiasm here is really limited because, well, you know, you brought up a great example, Ken Furry in any of Rob's movies. And that's a transcendent casting choice. Like they, like Rob doesn't just bring him on set. He gives him some damn good material. He gives him some juicy stuff and he makes him a pretty, well, not, not integral to the story, but, you know, he, 
he's a lasting impression on anybody who watches those movies. Uh, again, Quentin Tarantino. I mean, th that's like any actor who was big back in the 70s is dying for a call from Quentin Tarantino. But this is right. You know, this is it's a nice nod. Honestly, again, if this were a couple of years later, I feel like they could have sold this in a different way. Like, come see Tom Atkins. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I, Halloween 3 love was not there. Uh, not, neither neither the creeps love no. was not was, nope. was was not a blip on the radar. People were not gaga for Tom Atkins. So again, it's credit to the filmmakers that you know it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a gay cachet. They clearly love Tom Atkins. I mean, who doesn't? But yeah, I think I think uh, I've said enough about Tom here. I want to ask you a question, and this is one of those broad, big picture questions about this whole oh. era of remakes. Okay. Okay. Why do you think this movie and so many of these other remakes couldn't produce sequels? Like, isn't that interesting to you? It's interesting and, and actually, believe it or not, upsetting in a way for me because, oh, how am I going to put this? Okay, I am pro remake. I am pro reboot. Very much so. I think it's it's a great tool for a filmmaker who's kind of unknown or or is kind of rising to get an opportunity to do something special and fun related to a source material that's going to sell a bunch of tickets. I don't give a shit about how people say it's oh it ruins my enjoyment of the original that means that you're I, I that's a completely invalid argument to me just watch the original movie if you don't like the remake that is how I feel strongly even of the remakes that I don't like. But. I've always kind of wanted that big sequel feel in my time, you know, like for movies like this, like growing up as, as somebody who wasn't allowed to watch horror movies, right? I, the only horror movies I had seen by the time I was in my teens was pretty much just the Halloween movies. And that's only because they played on AMC around October and I could sneak them or think I sneak them um, at the time. But like, there was this allure to these other movies, right? It's like, oh, Nightmare on Elm Street, these these classic iconic movies. And I know that My Bloody Valentine is not that, but you know, as time goes on, you hear about these new movies and you're exposed to these new horror films. And there's not been a, a lot of examples uh, in our time since you know we've been enjoying and consuming these movies, especially since we've been able to see them in theaters that we can anticipate these big slasher sequels. I mean, like the Halloween movies that they made recently were a good example, but that was ruined by COVID for me. I didn't get to see the last two movies in theaters. I saw the first one, which was great. And I loved that, but I didn't really get that. So like when, when Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 came out and all that stuff and I saw trailers, I was like, okay, you know, even as a kid, I was thinking like, oh, maybe we're gonna get this like, all these movies are going to be remade and then they're going to get a ton of sequels and i'm going to get to see them i'm going to actually go get our to see generation them. will get to have our own versions of these characters and these franchises yes yes and that this they is would be reborn like you know how we're always resurrecting the universal monsters right right and nobody yes. nobody bats an eye when we do that it's not like how how dare you a frankenstein monster <laughs> you, Brandon you, Frazier. <laughs> you're pissing on the on the grave of boris karloff like nobody gets no they're 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 fucking knickers in a twist so to say about that <laughs> no because uh, the idea got really normalized i mean those movies and those characters were being remade immediately you know by hammer studios yes. and then for generations to come and it looked like that might have happened with some of these characters uh i mean michael myers doesn't he doesn't need that he's already he's already up there in the in the upper tier of our icons and i think jason and freddie are are right up there too although it's interesting that even their movies couldn't get sequels i mean no rob got really one insane. sequel and yeah. you know it, he if he had played ball he could have gotten more sequels but you know he didn't want a third movie and you know there there was bureaucratic problems behind the scenes i right. mean they were uh, according to scout taylor compton they were weeks away from shooting the movie every everybody was ready and then uh you know somebody somewhere pulled the plug as that happens but jason and freddie they didn't even they, they didn't even get one sequel no and this movie absolutely deserved a sequel in my mind um i i would have loved to see a sequel to this uh, they, they had one sequel. written <laughs> they had one written uh todd farmer has said since that he has one written he he's he's hoping 
that one day they'll come back and say that they want to make this. Obviously, at this point, as every year goes by, that becomes less likely, um, which, you know, maybe that's a beneficial thing. Maybe they'll remake My Bloody Valentine again someday, and it'll be even better, and who knows? But, you know, I would have loved to see all of the movies. So, like, I'm going to say the big three remakes in my mind from that time were this uh, Friday and Nightmare, as far as, like, box office is concerned. Uh, the all Texas of those Chainsaw Massacre, is, it's up there. Yeah, but that by the time that this era came around, we were on another reboot, Texas Chainsaw 3D, which wasn't that was a few years after this. That was like what, few years was after 2012, maybe. I mean the 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 prequel, which we've talked about previously, the Texas the Chainsaw beginning. Massacre, the beginning, that was yes. a few years before this, right? That was that 2006. didn't do too well commercially, though. I don't think did it. It did not. Which I think that and and Halloween two, which comes out this year, 2009, probably showed execs that there wasn't enough interest in sequels to these people wanted to you know see remakes they wanted to see you know things that they recognized but there wasn't enough interest there to generate a franchise i think rob's movie as much as i love rob zombies halloween 2 i do think it kind of ruined the chances for these other movies to get sequels and it's still happening today like i mean child's play was a pretty decent box office success when that came out um and uh, that didn't get a sequel well that was um, in a really awkward position where again there was a was. whole parallel continuity happening right that fans were much more loyal to right and and that sucks uh for for that movie i we just talked about that at the end of uh, season one of this show and um i would have loved to have seen a sequel for that and that stands for these movies but i do think rob's really did ruin it because like the first halloween that rob made i mean that smashed like that broke records <laughs> at the box office that was a huge success yeah um and then the second one came out and people were excited about it kind of but then i think they, they were the interested i'm i'm sure look that movie it could have it, it could have been everything that the fans wanted it to be but it was never going to make the same amount of money because there were too many people that were just too turned off from what rob did in that first movie like I've met people yeah. who saw the first one in theaters and didn't see the second because they hated it or they at least realized that Rob's vision here was not for them. I'll say something controversial about that real quick. <laughs> I, as much as I absolutely love Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, if, for, if somehow I would have been working in the industry then, obviously I would have had to have been born much earlier, but if they came to me and they said, hey, Rob doesn't want to make a sequel to his movie, but we do you know, help, help us put this piece of the puzzle together. I wouldn't have done anything that he did in Halloween too. I mean, it's just, it's so out of the question to me of, of what you can do with a sequel. That is part of why That's I love why it so That's why it's much. so good. Yes, it's part of why I love it so much. But I do believe there is a world where you could have marketed an incredibly successful sequel to Rob Zombie's Halloween without getting rid of all of the bad will that that first movie had. Let's not forget that a lot of the trouble that started for Halloween afterwards was not necessarily the immediate audience reception. It was the fact that when it released to home media, they couldn't see that movie they saw in theaters anymore. That's, and they um, still very that's much a good point. cannot. That's a good Yeah, unless and, you buy some, some uh, double feature Blu-ray that's only yes. produced in Canada. In which I, I own, by the way, and, and mine is a French copy, <laughs> um, <laughs> a region-free French copy, and, and it, it has English. I think this theatrical version of that movie is much better. I do think there's a world where you can where you can create an incredibly successful sequel, and maybe in that world, you get a My Bloody Valentine 2. You know, you get a Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2 uh, yeah, in, but in look, 2011 I mean, or 12. But. I don't know, because Halloween 2, where that drops in the timeline... To me, it comes out in 2009. So, uh, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning came out and and failed. And uh, Friday the 13th, well, that was produced this year. I'm trying to figure out exactly where things line up because to me, Halloween 2 comes out pretty late in the game of the remake craze. Like August of 09. August of 09. Yeah. And the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake was 2003. So, I mean, you just can't pin it all on on Rob here. No, I I think these movies not getting the sequel, I do believe is directly is 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 directly linked to Rob's Halloween too. But I I I only think that because it I don't think this was meant to be the end 
or even like the late middle, I guess you could say for, for, because like they were still doing well commercially when they came out. And then that eventually would end as time went on. Texas Chainsaw 3D didn't do super well. It did okay. Um, but like the thing didn't do well at all. <laughs> um, and there's it a lot of movies still that came out that crazy didn't to me. do at all. No, but it's crazy to me that that original Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake by Marcus Nispel never got a sequel. It's crazy. I it got a prequel uh, that nobody asked for. I'm sure of it. I don't care no. <laughs> how many people on that team were like the fans just were asking so many questions, like maybe rhetorical questions, but not <laughs> not something to justify a whole movie why they didn't you know what it is it's because they chopped off leatherface's arm at the end of, of that see, movie but okay would you not agree that it would have been fucking awesome to see leatherface with a chainsaw hand in the next movie uh yeah and then they would have gotten a call from sam raimi being like hey oh you come on it's uh, sam raimi would have loved it everybody would have loved it but, it's uh, been sam, awesome. sam might have but my point is it's it's kind of been done very I, famously I get it. And, and you don't even have to go that route. You could have done something different, but, but the fact that give him a hook for a hand, I don't know something, just do something, give him somebody else's hand at this point. I mean, the dude's got to wear masks of people's faces, give him somebody else's hand. I don't really give a shit. Just do something. You could have even gone the crazy route. Like the original sequel did to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The fact that you had this look of Leatherface that to my opinion was the best look to date. I thought it was incredible. I love the remake and how they made him look. I think you had one of the best attempts at a remake ever at that point, as far as horror is concerned, and you don't capitalize with a sequel. You make a prequel that nobody asked for with a, a cast that I don't think anybody really would have cared. I mean, Jordana Brewster's in it, but like, is she your big ticket item? Like, I love Jordana Brewster, but like, what were they thinking? And 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 I do think that that did play into obviously later when Rob Zombie's Halloween Two failed as well. You know why we still have a hard time getting sequels to remakes. Um, but what were they thinking? Yeah, <laughs> I want course, a sequel to My Bloody Valentine. The man. other Give thing is me. like Halloween Two didn't fail. Like it didn't bomb at the box office. It, it wasn't it made a money. Bomb. No. It, it made less money than the original, but you know, right. that's the story of these franchises. It is diminishing returns. I mean, especially Halloween. Halloween yeah, Halloween. Took a huge dip throughout its history. I mean, it's just like, it's just like peaks and valleys. Yeah. So, I mean, Halloween four, which, you know, started this whole new era for the franchise, they made like a, a fifth of what the original made. If, oh, no, like, it, it didn't make a lot. And then Halloween five made peanuts compared to halloween 4 and then halloween 6 barely made anything yeah so uh, i mean again yeah. the, the studio at least they saw the box office return for the second and they thought it's worth making a third movie um i guess not with rob but it's worth making another movie in this continuity so it's just not as simple as that i think there were plenty of chances for these remakes to 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 prove their staying power and their ability to, you know, kind of really rejuvenate these franchises, these titles, and it just, it didn't catch on any time, any time they tried. Um, and then when they didn't try, it was almost more damning because what does it say when you're not even going to bother to make a sequel to your Friday the 13th remake that was the highest grossing of these whole remakes? It made over a hundred million dollars. And, and this is kind of what worries me about how it seems like the newest, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it turns out better than I anticipate, but like, we're heading towards another Halloween reboot, it looks like, and it's looking like we're going to have a whole cinematic universe of Halloween, and I don't love that at the moment. Um, you know, again, I'm very pro sequel, I'm very pro all of that, but, um, you know, I don't know about this all encompassing world where we have TV shows and movies all kind of linked in together. I hope it does well, um, just like I hope these movies would have done well back then and how I hope they would have gotten sequels. Um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, we are living in a world where there is no My Bloody Valentine 2 or 3D2, whatever they would have called it. Um, and um, we haven't heard anything from this. I don't even know if you really want to call it a franchise. Uh, I mean, I guess you can. Two movies, uh, one original, one remake. I don't know what you'd call that but um that ip has not been touched since 09 um again I, i'll say this 
you can c complain about a lot of things about My Bloody Valentine. I don't think anybody could really call it boring. Um, I couldn't. Uh, I had a lot of fun watching this. And I think a big reason for me and for non-horror fans, this might sound psychotic, um, but I did enjoy the kills in this movie quite a bit. Uh, I thought it, it packed a punch. Now, I get where people would say that it's a little, <laughs> let's say, um, synthetic. Uh, I get that argument, but I felt like they were memorable. I felt like there was a lot of, of fun to be had with them. Some of them were, were I mean, damn near slapstick. I mean, it was, it was, I, I laughed at, at one of them pretty hard. Um, what did you think about the kills in this movie? Obviously something very important in a slasher movie. Um, it is, although I don't weigh the kills nearly as much as other people do. No, absolutely not. Some people like you could have the worst movie ever. If it's got great kills, they're going to love it. Um, yeah, you know, which hello, the prowler called a, thank wanted... you. <laughs> I don't know. The prowler's not that bad, but it is, it's not the, one of the best movies ever. Like it's not one of the best horror movies. It's not up there with the legendary horror movies in my mind. It's not even Joseph, Joseph Cito's best movie, obviously. No, <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, the kills are, are creative, but synthetic. It reminds me a lot of Saw 3D that way. The gnarliest scene I've ever witnessed is Chester Bennington's death in Saw 3D. Ooh. That, that should, uh, that should I give that movie it. a real legacy. That's something that it should, that movie should be remembered a lot more fondly than it is, honestly. <laughs> But I don't know, remember it as non fondly as everybody else does. Like, I, I, maybe I need to rewatch it again. But even upon rewatch a few years ago, I was like, this isn't that bad. If you marathon the Saw movies, you cannot tell me that that is a substantially worse movie. It, than it was in a marathon. Those. It was yeah. in a marathon. Yeah, yeah I, I watched it in a marathon and I just thought like, it's not like if somebody told me it was their favorite Saw movie, I'd be shocked for sure. But, you know, like it's not. I don't know. Maybe it'll come on the show at some point. Look, I, it's I not really the don't final... think it's that bad it's not the final song movie anymore. So the weight of those ex expectations are off and now it's just another, yes. it's just another saw sequel and it's a gnarly one at that, but people don't remember like the gore hounds don't love it because of its synthetic quality. And I think this movie has the same problem. It's an odd case where there was clearly a lot of thought put into it, but the execution was just never going to, uh, it was always going to fail with, the old school fans who who are coming to see it because of um, the original movie. Now, if you were like a teenager seeing this, if this is one of you know your first horror movies in theaters, you know this is going to rock your world. I mean, that massacre oh, yeah. at the uh, at the party with the actual Harry Warden. By the way, I I actually I think it's really cool that we actually get like Harry Warden in action in this movie because in yeah. the original he's just a mythic figure. So right. it was cool. One of one of the of the small changes that I do like is that we get to see him really on a rampage. There should be more rampage scenes in horror movies. Like I Thank get you. tired of stalking. Yes. I, I think rampage scenes are awesome. Even in movies that, that maybe haven't captured people as much as, uh, as, as it would have hoped. Um, a recent a recent Netflix remake comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> everybody remembers the rampage scene because it was fucking awesome. Uh, I movies need to do that more. Uh, although you have to do it right, I do think you can do a rampage scene wrong. I think of uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the collection, the sequel to the Collector. Um, there is like a somewhat of a rampage scene in that that I don't think was very good. But like Halloween Six. Perfect example. Everybody loves the rampage scene from that. Everybody loves rampage scenes. To me, the the scene that made me realize how much I love a good slasher rampage was Freddy versus Jason. Jason, in his one real example. shining moment, uh, gets to lay waste to an entire party of chuds. It was it was awesome. It, it's <sighs> Freddy versus Jason is its own discussion, but I will say that uh, Jason's one shining moment in that movie is is obviously that scene yeah um and uh you know who knows maybe we could see more someday uh to anybody listening to this who may be a decision maker in hollywood give me or gabe a call i'm sure we can give you some great scenes <laughs> give us a call man let us write these let us write these big movies i'm telling you you're you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get some box office success from that but uh no in all seriousness um yeah th this movie i i do so I want to ask you, do you have a, a favorite uh, kill in this movie? Well, I'll always remember the 
the the pickaxe through the eye like the oh pickaxe the, the eye, eye okay. is stuck there at the end um very very uh friday the 13th 3d uh style very like but it. that's one of those moments that um not only is it a cool scene but i do wish i had the 3d glasses to enjoy it in all of its 3d glory and by the way as far as 3d slashers go this is one of the less egregious with its 3d like yeah i'm gonna break some hearts here maybe that original Friday the 13th 3D sucks fucking ass. I, it was, it's shitty in 3D. It's shitty in 2D. Any amount of Ds, it's going to, to suck ass. Um, and oh, part God. of the reason is like, they really think the audiences who watch those movies are so dumb that they're going to be excited at the sight of a, of, of a telephone pole or a baseball bat or a fucking rat sticking its way into the screen. Like that's, that's what we're here for. It's like jangle your yeah. keys in front of me and that'll insult my intelligence less. Yeah. I don't know if you are, are familiar with the sketch with uh, um, John Candy uh, from SCTV. Uh, but like, it, it very much reminds me of that. Like early 3d it was very much that where they would just be like, would you like a bowl of pudding? And then they would move it towards the screen. And it's like, okay, all right. <laughs> I don't think you're using the, I do think this movie and I actually even Texas Chainsaw 3d to an extent uses its 3d somewhat effectively. I mean, there are some scenes that very, that feel very forced with it, but like, there's one, scene where Texas, <laughs> there's one scene where Leatherface throws his chainsaw at the screen, which, you know, I imagine like, you know, the famous Lumiere brothers uh, 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 motion picture of, of the train coming at the screen. Right. People, uh, people actually like getting scared because they, they felt in that moment that they were going to get hit by a train. I just like to imagine like the audiences of like the early 1900s France going into a little like uh cineplex <laughs> and, and watching Leatherface throw his chainsaw at the screen. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, and and like there are movies outside of the genre that did 3D bad too. Like, you know, it's I'm not just gonna beat up on horror, you know. Oh no, no, um, no, no, no. And, I you know, the Resident a, Evil movies went that route as well. And and those are not really considered horror movies per se, but um you know yeah it's they're, my they're... least favorite gimmick in all of motion picture history so i'm not singling I out love the idea of it it's such a cool idea but nobody does it right in my like like some people do it okay but nobody's done it perfect and i don't know i and like when i was a kid sick, when i, I saw it. the adventures of shark boy and lava girl i definitely got excited when it was time to put on your shark boy yeah, 3d right. glasses <laughs> Like, <laughs> wasn't that one of those movies then that they would flash like a like a text warning on the screen telling you? Yeah, and that's how on? you do yeah. it. That's how you do it. <laughs> I love it. See, this is the shit that I'm talking about, man. It's so gimmicky and just commercially. But this movie fucking, isn't. It's great. It's almost like it's not gimmicky enough. Like, if it's gonna be a gimmick, I really want to see how you're gonna like turn this into an event. But I get it. I mean, honestly, most 3D movies they're not events. They're just here's this mediocre movie that's actually going to give you a migraine now because of our yeah. <laughs> our plastic apple vision pro goggles that were ending you as you enter the theater so bro, it was even worse back then are you kidding me we got the, ours used to be like paper they were literally just like they cardboard were paper, and these, red like, and <laughs> green red and green foil and the, the my bloody valentine 3d glasses that i still have somewhere they're somewhere in this house are exactly those they're the the kind that they'd hand out to you in the theater and you got to keep them because they were so shitty <laughs> that they'd probably break during the movie uh if not later when you brought them home um and they were it was you guys have it way better now watching 3d movies like avatar 7 or whatever the fuck we're on now um yeah they say no better. avatar 7 they didn't uh maybe if james cameron no. had directed my bloody valentine 3d it would have revolutionized the entire industry it would have changed the game forever no thanks as it is it is that. it is at the crossroads of so many trends and that's why i'm just like i just don't have like a real soft spot for this movie it is like like okay we're, we're gonna do a remake we're gonna th do 3d we're gonna get the guy from supernatural which I i'm sure jensen ackles was happy to make the movie but you know just like one thing after another of like grabbing, grabbing oh, all yeah. of the things in the air. Absolutely. And I get why they would do it too. You know, it makes sense to me why they would do that on paper.
Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know. By the way, we haven't we haven't talked about the twist yet at all. So should we get into that? I think we should. I think we should. So in the original movie, the killer turns out to be Axel, uh, and you know Axel, who is he's the antagonist of that love triangle. Yes. Right. So in the original movie, it's Axel. In this movie, it turns out to be dun, 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 Jensen Ackles, uh, Mr. Mr. Name above the title himself, uh, Jensen Ackles. Yeah. So it's a rare case of a movie that that like literally like it, it, it has the opposite twist of its original film. It it goes it, it does a 180 on you by the end right yeah um i don't know i guess uh, I, I i don't even know if the question is do you like it it's do you do you think that was was that smart or okay i'm trying to find exactly the way i want to ask this do you think that actually overall benefited the movie or do you think it hurt it its rewatchability um somewhere in the middle honestly um because here, here's the thing right like you do ultimately take a risk by making your big ticket actor the killer in a movie like you know you, you, like i get you doing that swerve like that makes sense but that's a bit of a risk to take because people are going to take that one of two ways they're going to go oh this is cool i've never seen this actor that i love do this kind of thing before um or they're gonna be like, uh, "This is stupid. Uh, this would. Ne- I don't want to ever watch this again." And I think more people kind of followed that. I think for me, I appreciated it much more after watching the original. This I had seen this first, uh, and I, I kind of saw it coming. Like I know that sounds weird to say, but like I kind of was just kind of like, "Ah." Uh, A lot of the reviews I saw on Letterboxd <laughs> saw it coming. Yeah, but I think after watching the re- the the original. If that would have been a more popular movie or, or if that would have been more available and more people had seen it, I do think that that it would have been a bit of a swerve in this because I had kind of forgotten about this movie. I mean, I, I you know, I had seen it a few times and that's why I was so surprised when I enjoyed it as much as I did this time around. Um, but after I had watched the original, I was like, oh, I got to go rewatch the remake again. You know, like I just it's natural. And I did. And I was like, oh, OK, you know, I. I had seen this before and I kind of, you know, didn't see it coming because I forgot about it. Um, so I mean, it's not a great twist in the original, which is no, no, I mean, it's, it's sort of a last, uh, it's like a afterthought of a twist. Right. So it's not yeah. like, like, like all these slasher mysteries, like there's no good slasher mystery. Friday the 13th is one of the worst murder mysteries ever. Like it, like <laughs> it, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm trying to think of a movie that cheats its audience more with its reveal. And I can't, I can't think of a more egregious, egregious example of Friday the 13th. Pamela Voorhees yeah. is literally, I mean, how do we even know that she exists before she shows up and reveals herself as the killer? Right. But they could not get Betsy Palmer for more than, for more than two or three days. I bet she just hated, she hated the script so much. Probably couldn't pay her. <laughs> they had no money. It's very possible. It's very possible. <laughs> No, but the, you know, My Bloody Valentine and it's, but it, it kind of works in a different level because it, it validates the audience's uh, uh, relationships with these characters, right? Our our good guy saves the day and the guy we hated turns out to be the villain. You know, it's a cheap twist, but it's uh, it's satisfying on, on that kind of level. Right. The problem here is it's not a great twist. In fact, I'd argue it it cheats in a number of different ways and it kind of sours us to our hero our jensen ackles and it asks us to to care about the scummy police officer who has been cheating on his wife and okay i know this isn't the same so I don't want it to seem like it's a one, one-to-one comparison. But one of the things I like about um, this sort of transformation into a villain that we get in Tucker and Dale versus Evil, I don't know if you've seen that. I, I adore classic. that movie. It's a classic. 
modern classic. I love it. Um, one of the things I like about that is that the guy playing, the guy who turns out to be the villain isn't necessarily doing villain shit the whole movie. But he's, but he, you're, you're getting these seeds planted that once this turns around and once we start seeing, once these perspectives kind of mash together in that movie, he's going to be the villain. And, and when it happens, it's not any less satisfying. It's not any less problematic or, or it's not any more problematic once you get there. It's just, it is what it is and it, and it ends up paying off in a, in a good way. And in this movie, I didn't feel like they planted enough seeds for it to happen. It, it just felt like one of those things where it was like, and I, I'm not accusing the, the screenwriter uh, of being lazy or anything. I would never do that, especially in a movie like this. Uh, I wouldn't accuse them of doing so. But from what it seems like to me is like they got to that part of the script and they were like, they started writing the name of uh, of the character who was the original killer, Axel, right? It was Axel. Axel, was the, yeah. Yeah, I always forget his name. Um, but they started writing Axel and then Axel was, re and then they were just like, mm-mm. And then they just erased it and they penciled in Jensen Ackles' character's name. They might have just put his name as an actor. They might have just put Jensen Ackles uh, is the killer. And it, it just felt like something where they were just like, they won't see this coming. And like, you, you kind of do, but like in the worst way, you know, you're supposed to like plant those seeds, but also plant seeds of doubt. And, and it doesn't really do that um, in, a, in, a, in an effective way, at least in my mind. Also, anytime you have to, okay. <sighs> And I don't know. Anytime a twist hinges on um, the fact that you showed the audience uh, a fictional scenario, like a, a scenario that was only happening in the mind of a character, not in reality. Right. I don't know what else to call that. I mean, it, if you think it was a really cool twist, you're going to say they had to do that. They had to, you know, that you'll, you'll make whatever excuse. I do that with my favorite movies. I, I get it. I will make excuses for like people try to point out the plot holes in Terminator 2. That movie doesn't have plot holes because it's cake fucking ass, uh, but definitely has plot holes. So yeah, it, it all rests on the power of, of the punch, right? How hard that twist hits. And I think it sounds like, cause I, I didn't, I had the twist actually spoiled to me before I saw it. So I never got to have a, an objective read on it, but it sounds like from you, from your perspective, didn't, didn't work because it didn't pack the punch yeah especially on the first i i definitely had more appreciation for it the, the after watching the original film um because i i did feel like um if you had seen that movie first the original and you didn't know what was coming in this one it would have packed more punch to it i do believe that because it even packed more punch when i had already seen the movie and i went back and watched the original again or, or for the first time rather um but i i do think that especially for a movie that's supposed to be so com commercially successful, I don't think you can really bank on the fact that people had seen the original and then so so you could then subvert their expectations of what's supposed to happen. Um, because I feel like that's the only way to really watch this and have an appreciation for it is if you're seeing it for like a deep appreciation. I'm not saying that everybody is the same with that, but from my perspective, it's like this feels like an ending that was sort of made to swerve fans of My Bloody Valentine from 81. And... Um, that's great, you know, like to, to have something deep cut like that is is great. But when you're making this huge commercial horror movie, like you just can't bank that people have seen this at the time niche Canadian slasher film. And you shouldn't bank on it ever. Uh, no, no, even no, no, if no. It's I safe. completely agree. Yes, you, you should always make this movie for the purpose of if you're going to make it such a standalone, which I do think this movie like does a pretty decent job of doing throughout. You don't need to see the original. Like this isn't like the the requel effect. Like you know, you get with like the town that dreaded sundown, right? Where it's like you can watch the new version of that movie and and still somewhat appreciate it. But like it makes a lot more sense if you've seen the first movie. Well, and that's it, a case it, where the first movie is a part of the meta world. Yes, of the, it's of like the a remake. meta sequel or whatever. And but but in my opinion, a movie does really well when it's remaking something or retouching on something that it you don't have to see the original to enjoy. And I do think that this does that for the most part, but I think that ending, unless somebody has completely been submerged by the atmosphere of the movie and completely into it and hasn't been taken out by all of the stuff that I've said I've appreciated <laughs> about this commercial nature of it, um, it's just not going to hit the same. I will say some of the slickest 
uh, action happens in that climax though. And Jensen Ackles, I agree. I, it, the ironic thing is if they, if they had just embraced this whole twist earlier in the story, and if you could have given me a whole movie of, of bad guy Ackles, that could have been actually a real treat for, for everybody, you know, supernatural fans or not, you know, cause he, he can, or at least a little he earlier, could do this. at least a little earlier, but that climax does have some juice to it. It actually, it recreates some of the more famous uh, shots of the original movie, but actually improves upon them. I, I think especially that shot where he's walking down the corridor, uh, well, like walking down the shaft and and, and kind of like just taking out all the lights with the pickaxe. That's, oh, that's a very memorable scene for me. Yeah, too. that's like stuff. Yeah, and I, I think, like, thinking back, like, it, especially the fact that they were going to make a sequel where the original killer actually does break out of his, uh, his insane asylum and go on a murder spree, um, I think it would have been cool, like, halfway through the movie for them to, like, find out that the guys escaped, right? And then they're like, well, then who's been killing everybody? <laughs> and then that's kind of where you find out, like, oh, it's been him. And then you get this whole movie, the whole rest of the movie. Like, if you could have done that halfway in, you could have gotten a good amount of stuff with this guy we think is going to be the hero. And then a good amount of stuff where he's not the hero. And maybe, you know, the the real guy ends up showing up at some point. It could have been like the original Psycho where Norman Bates is slowly revealed to be an antagonist. We don't know. Right. There's still things that we don't know until the very end. But, you know, Anthony Perkins is still allowed to fucking shine right. in, in that role and, you know, becomes one of the great villains in cinema history. Uh by by the end of that first movie not i'm not saying that like they should have like followed that playbook exactly but oh, right. there's ways you yeah. can do it i guess i guess i'll kick us off here i usually i know we usually start on the other side but i kind of telegraph my opinion here um uh, a little bit uh so I'm, i'll go ahead and i'll go ahead and just say some final thoughts here look this movie's not going to be for everybody um I, it hasn't been so far and it's not going to be for anybody who's visiting it for the first time since uh or for you know for the first time after the show um but uh, what I do think this does accomplish is exactly what the filmmakers were looking to do. You know, they were looking to make a competently made, fun, um, you know, uh, slasher movie uh, that, that would make a lot of money and that did make a lot of money. Uh, I had a ton of fun with it. I think it's a fun movie to watch overall. And I, I think it's one that does deserve to be in the conversation for, for better, uh, one of the better uh, remakes. Uh, you know, it's not to say it doesn't have its problems. I, I do believe it does have them. Um, but I think, you know, if you go into this expecting it to be the worst movie ever, I think you'll be really surprised. If you go into it just thinking, I don't really think that, you know, there's much to this, um, like I did this time around, I think you're going to be really shocked. And um, I'm happy to say that that my opinion uh, over time has just grown for this movie, um, and uh, I'm happy to say that I'm I'm gonna be a little controversial here, and I'm gonna say that this movie's got a 3.9. I'm sorry, 2.9. Um, I'm gonna say that it's I'm gonna say it's actually good. Um, I I do enjoy this. Yeah, I know I've t- I beat down a lot on it here. Uh, but... Well, it has a 2.4. Oh, it has 2.4. My my bad. Uh, then definitely and actually good. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 2003 has a 2.9. Um, but, uh, yes, this movie is awesome. Um, I, I think, uh, there are parts of it that really captured me, that really, uh, I had a blast when rewatching. Um, I actually can't wait till the next time I watch this. I think I'm going to make this a part of my yearly February watches, um and uh i'm excited to do so so yes my bloody valentine 3d is actually good for me i'm glad that uh it it's a movie that people can enjoy i always want to see the name my bloody valentine represented well be it the original film be it uh classic shoegaze bands from the 1990s uh (laughs) my bloody valentine that's that's something that should be here to stay. And I think uh, this this movie carries the torch respectfully. Like it's, it's in a way, it's an ideal remake because it does nothing to desecrate the memory of the original. In fact, I can imagine it's a case where people will go to, to, to discover the original, but it's a movie that's more useful than it is good in that respect. Like I don't have a lot of fondness for the content of the film, but I do consider it uh, a net positive. 
right? Out of all of those remakes that were that were made, this is one that uh, we could have used, if nothing else, for the fact that now, you know, I have the Shout Factory copy of the original My Bloody Valentine, and I wonder if it would have warranted uh, that kind of, um, you know, reappraisal uh, without the efforts of the filmmakers behind this film. So I will give it respect. I will tip my hat to it. It's not in my rotation. It's just, it doesn't have a part in my bloody heart. But uh, I acknowledge that, you know, this could actually be a great gateway slasher for uh, a whole generation. So 2.4, it's too low. It should acknowledge those points. So I'm going to say it's not that bad. Perfect. I'm glad to see we came out favorably on this movie. Um, you know, remakes are one that uh, are a hot point of discussion. Um, I hope to bring more on this show. You know, I, I hope that uh, we get that opportunity uh, at some point in the near future. Um, I love talking about horror on this, man. I, you know, horror is one of those genres that just uh, it's it can be so much fun if you let it um, to, to well, just be especially a part of that. because lately we've been talking almost exclusively about comedies. Yeah, uh, first two episodes of season two were comedy movies, uh, and um, and you know, God, I mean, we did touch on horror with Child's Play uh, at the end of season one there, but uh, you know, we started this so this podcast started on horror movies. Um, the the reason this exists is because of horror movies, <laughs> so uh, it's fun to be able to go back and revisit that. You know, I do love that we cover uh, we give some love to every genre. I'd like to think, but. Um, yeah, it was it was fun talking about a horror movie, especially one that uh, I remember very fondly. Uh, you know, as far as the commercials go, you know, you see you see commercials as a kid, and you just think, "Oh God, I want to see that." And this is one of those movies for me. So um, glad that we got to talk about it here, and uh, thank you everybody who watched this. Uh, this was a much longer recording than I thought we would have. So I'll, yeah, we'll I'll see how long see the length it of the ends episode up being in the edit. Um, uh, but we got into a yeah. great discussion about this now this period that's now totally in the rear view mirror of the slasher remake boom the platinum yeah. dunes boom you could say because they were really they they were the first ones there at that gold rush and they uh they they were kind of the architects behind that behind that whole scene so just being able to look back at that because it was uh it, it was distinct from this era of requels and you know that's something we didn't even touch on i i think anytime we talk about the next remake we can compare and contrast you know the the era of remakes uh, the era of remakes to the era of requels right and overall probably because of nostalgia i'm definitely team remake and uh this this movie has it's funny i think i would say this movie has the best and the worst qualities of those remakes it was respectful it actually did dare to play on on the expectations we had in a, like in an actual like subversive way but it was almost too dependent on the on people's um, memory of the original which in this case was a bad bet because barely anybody remembered my bloody valentine so if this movie continues to garner an audience, that'll be interesting to see. And maybe one day it'll like its predecessor, like the original, it'll have a cold following of its own one day. That'll be, that'll be quite respectful, but for right now. Yeah. Kind of like a, a gateway drug. And for now eligible for the show, you know, who knows uh, what can happen. I mean, if, if Letterboxd were around uh, in the eighties, uh, think of the turnaround that, a movie like Halloween three had, you know, um, you know, even, even in the era that letterbox has existed, that movie has shot up, uh, in the rating that it's had. So, you know, hopefully someday we see the fortune turn around for this movie. I'd really like to see it. Um, for now though, um, you know, we are where we stand. Hopefully we can give it a, not that bad bump. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's, going to be interesting over time to see how many other horror remakes and sequels and requels that'll make it to the show. I'm really, really excited to get more of them here. Um, you know, cause I think that's a very, I think we can both agree like that, that era, you know, from, from like <laughs> the early two thousands through like the, I'd say early 2010s, 
um, you didn't know what they were going to try to remake next. And, uh, you know, it was a really interesting time that I, I'd really like to keep diving into. I know I can think of two movies in particular that might make a great, you know, finale here in season two. Uh, maybe we'll see. We'll see what it looks like down the line. But um, for now, uh, thank you all for tuning in and, and hearing us uh, two schmucks talk about My Bloody Valentine 3D. Um, hopefully you uh, like this enough to watch these two schmucks talk about a lot of other movies. We've talked about a lot of other things on this show. If you are specifically here for horror remakes, we've got a couple of those we've talked about already. And uh, we just like to have fun talking movies. So thanks for, for sticking here with us and, and having fun with us. Um, Gabe, what are some ways that people can support the show if they really want to help these two schmucks out here? Well, I thought we'd made it pretty obvious uh, that we have a Patreon. No, uh, Did we? Yeah, you can uh, support us on Patreon. You can share our content with your friends and family. Uh, you can uh, write encouraging comments. Those go a long way. Uh, yeah. Or you can write mean comments. Uh, I was excited to see some mean comments on our last video that shows that we're we're getting a wider reach. So let the haters come, man. That's uh, that's. I was so I was so happy. I almost hearted them. I was like, <laughs> dude, this is great. <laughs> oh, but but even if you want to just uh, reach out to us directly, uh, notthatbadpod.com has links to all of our social media pages, but it also has an email form. You want to send us something, we'll read it. <laughs> well, you know, we're happy to engage with anybody that watches the show. You got some suggestions for us, you know, we're happy to look at it. Obviously, we are not a suggestion-based program. If we were, we would never stop making <laughs> episodes and we would have a lot of episodes that end up like our Waterworld episode. Um, and so hopefully, uh you know that that uh will encourage you guys to get, engage with the show definitely tell us what you think about our episodes uh and you can find our entire catalog as well on our website hopefully you'll give it a visit um but uh, of course the patreon is there if you decide you want to give us that extra layer of support uh mr tice anything else before you take us out with our outro uh, again we're coming out with this the day after valentine's day but it's never too late uh to you know show your love for yeah. for that special someone in your life unless it's the day after valentine's day in which case it is too late so i hope you guys remembered and did something special <laughs> uh, but if you're in the doghouse you got the perfect podcast to keep you company here and not that bad oh yeah just guys being dudes just guys being dudes it's what we do <laughs> <laughs> all right and on that note not that we've summed up our entire existence yeah i think we can take us out so i'm gabe i'm connor and this is not that bad signing out <laughs> <laughs>